Good evening, everyone, to tonight's Global Issue Speaker Series. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, tonight's presentation, um, Women-Centered Development Projects in India, Ethiopia, and Mexico is a very exciting topic to talk about. And we have Dr. Ariana Cortez, Associate Professor of Sociology, here at ACC to um, walk us through these projects and how they affect and impact women uh, in these three countries uh, for both positive and negative uh, reasons. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, two things. Uh, we will have extra credit slips for those of you who are here for extra credit, and we'll pass those out at the end of the presentation rather than at the beginning. Um, and then we'll have a QA and a uh, <clears throat> at the end of the presentation, and we will have two microphones on each side. Before you ask your question, we'll hand you a microphone so we can capture that on the video recording. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ariana Cortez, as uh, William Hayden has said. And I just want to firstly thank William Hayden for organizing the Global Speaker Series. And also Maria Dorantes. She's somewhere in the back for the awesome publicity. Thank you for getting that out to everyone. Um, and yeah, I'm a sociology professor here. I'm new uh, to ACC as a full-time faculty member and really honored to be talking with you tonight. So I'm gonna share my findings um, from my work as an undergraduate student. Uh, I've never looked at a screen this big while I talk. This is quite enormous. I'm gonna move around a bit. From my undergraduate research in an honors sociology program, from my master's thesis in sociology, and then my PhD, which was in sociology and feminist studies. But I'm also gonna share about my process as a student along the way. How many of y'all out here are students right now? Okay, any first generation students like me? Awesome, I'm glad you're here. So part of the reason I do that is I think it's really important to render visible some of the invisibility, invisibility of what happens along the way in academia. Um, so I'm gonna talk probably a bit more um, about myself and my own experience than perhaps other presenters do and everything is fair game for questions. Um, so I got excited about research as a community college student. That's where I started my academic journey. And for my first sociology class, the professor, I think she offered it as extra credit to go for 20 minutes and do observation in a public place. I decided to take myself to a hospital room, to the waiting room of an emergency room at a hospital. Um, and I was there for over two hours and just like the notes kept flowing. I had all these brilliant ideas about inequality and what I was seeing, um, and I felt really excited about the possibility of research. I actually ended up doing more research after that class just on my own. I would go to the courthouse and observe court hearings and really started kind of thinking more academically about inequality. Then in a second sociology class, we had the opportunity to do a survey, and I did that with the parents of the low-income children I was supervising at an after-school program, um, and really kind of seeing the potential for what happens when we observe inequality in our society. Uh, but also, as you can imagine, feeling some other things as I was obsessively thinking about poverty and inequality. Any thoughts about what else I might have started to feel? thinking about poverty and inequality so often. Just call out some things that you think you might feel if you're spending most of your time as a student thinking about inequality. Disheartening. Disheartening. What else? Unfairness. Unfairness. Hopeless. What else? Hopeless. Yes, these are all some of the key words of the things that I was starting to feel. Um, in fact, I was totally overwhelmed and a little bit stuck. So I finished my AA, my associate's degree at community college, and I had a little gap between finishing that AA and getting ready to transfer to a four-year school. And I saved some money to go live in Costa Rica and do an international exchange program. Um, and then I started thinking about global inequality while I was there. So if I was overwhelmed thinking about inequality in a California courthouse, imagine what's happening in my mind as I'm trying to start think, thinking about inequality on a global scale. I transferred to University of California, Santa Barbara, and I was in a Latin American studies class, again, feeling a little bit stuck and uninspired about what was happening in the world. And my professor had us read this book. It was called Basta, Land, and the Zapatista Rebellion in Chiapas. Um, this book, in retrospect, I realize now, changed my life. It changed my enti the entire course of what I was going to do with my life. And I like to offer it as a plug for doing your classwork. Uh, you never know where it's going to take you. So if your instructors are recommending that you read something or, or check something out, there's probably good reason to it. 
So this book was about the Zapatista uprising. Um, just by a show of hands, are any of you familiar? I already know some of my colleagues are familiar with this term. Is anyone else in this room familiar with what happened in the Zapatista uprising? OK, good. I'm going to walk you through it. So it's sometimes called a rebellion. Other folks call it an uprising. It's been referred to as a revolution. Some of the members of the movement just call it a movement. Um, and it began in the early morning of January 1st, 1994. And it involved at least 3,000 armed indigenous peasants who are native folks who are native to the lands living on the countryside. And it included men, women, and children. Um, basically, they showed up in towns and large ranches on the morning of January 1st, 1994, wearing masks to cover their faces. They were armed. And they released a declaration of war on the state of Mexico. So in order to understand a little bit more about what they did, we'll start with the where and why. How many of you are familiar with where Chiapas, Mexico is? A couple of people. It's actually in the news today, right now, with the caravan of migrants coming through Central America. They have to cross through Tapachula, which is one of the main cities on the border there. So it's the southernmost state of Mexico on the border of Guatemala. Um, it's a very rich land, 40% uh, of Mexico's plant varieties, 66% of its birds, 80% of its beautiful butterflies, the Mayan runes, that. That actually exists somewhere in the world. It's in Chiapas. It's a real photograph. Um, but it's also been called an internal colony. So 30% of Mexico's fresh water leaves Chiapas. 30% of Mexico's fresh water comes from Chiapas. 35% of Mexico's electricity. Chiapas exports timber, petroleum, coffee, uranium, cattle, corn, bananas, honey, sugar, people. And what's left? Poverty. It's a very, very poor place. At the time of the uprising, it was the poorest state in Mexico, which was already a, a relatively poor country. Two-thirds of the people in Chiapas were living and dying in rural communities. One and a half million lacked access to medical care. 90% didn't have potable water, which is drinking water. 75% um, didn't have access to any sewage system. 72% of children were not completing the first grade. 80% of the rural population was malnourished. And Chiapas had the highest illiteracy, infant and maternal mortality rates in Mexico. And these were some of the highest in the world, actually comparable at the time to rates in sub-Saharan Africa. So very, 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 very difficult circumstances of poverty. When they rise up on that day, January 1st, 1994, this was the declaration of war that they released. This was the first statement they released. They said this. We are a product of 500 years of struggle. We have nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a roof over our heads, no land, no work, no health care, no food, nor education. Neither are we able to freely and democratically elect our political representatives, nor is there independence from foreigners, nor is there peace nor justice for ourselves and for our children. Today we say enough is enough. So some of the things that were really unique about the Zapatista movement were that they were critiquing globalization and neoliberalism, which basically we'll just use to mean free market capitalism. Um, but they also used globalization to draw worldwide attention to, this, to their plight. They were using the internet. They were very savvy in releasing this uh, message across the world. They also used a lot of symbolism, as you can see, in always wearing masks when they appear in public. Um, and even in the name that they chose for themselves, for themselves and the date that they decided to plan the uprising for. And then lastly, their early attention to gender. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of um, those aspects of this movement. So the Zapatistas took their name from Emiliano Zapata. And those are Zapatista members standing in front of um, a mural of Emiliano Zapata. And why they took that name is because Emiliano Zapata fought during the Mexican Revolution for land reform. And part of his struggle resulted in Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution. And basically, that article fought to redistribute land in the countryside in Mexico to poor peasants through establishing what's called a nejido system. Basically, these are just communal lands that can be passed down from generation to generation. And they historically couldn't be bought or sold. The Zapatista uprising was timed to happen the day that NAFTA went into effect, on January 1st, 1994. Does anyone in this room know what NAFTA stands for? Someone want to just say what the acronym stands for? North American Free Trade Agreement. North, Amer North American Free Trade Agreement, exactly. So this is that agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico, also in the news again today. Um, basically, it's a neoliberal trade agreement. But the important part here for us, thinking about the Zapatistas, was that in order for Mexico to enter that agreement, they had to amend that Article 27 of the Constitution to allow for those lands to be bought and sold. Part of the reasoning for that was that then those lands could be used to grow cheap exports that 
would belong to multinational companies instead of to, to families and community members. So the Zapatista movement recognized this. They released a statement saying that today the North American Free Trade Agreement begins, which is nothing more than a death sentence to the indigenous ethnicities of Mexico. Um, so they knew in picking this day that, the, that there was symbolic uh, meaning, and they kind of saw ahead to what was going to happen for indigenous peasants as a result of NAFTA. Also, all of the politicians were up all night celebrating, drinking champagne, eating caviar. They were hung over, and to wake up to this um, movement happening in the towns of Chiapas was very unexpected, again, because of the celebration of NAFTA. Another thing I mentioned um, was that they paid this early attention to gender inequality. Um, their largest military operation was led by a woman, Ana Maria. One half of their general command was made up of women, and a third of the armed forces in the Zapatista movement were women. That is the largest participation of women in any revolutionary movement in history up until that time. So I got excited again, thinking they're paying attention to gender inequality. And then this is the second document they release. The very first is the declaration of war on the Mexican government. The second is this, which is called the Women's Revolutionary Law. As you can see, there's 10 components to the law. I'm not going to read through it for you, but I'm going to just point to what I've highlighted here. Um, the first is the right to participate in the revolutionary struggle. The second is to work and receive a just salary. Um, the third, to decide the number of children they will have. The fourth, to have positions of authority. The fifth, to have primary attention in matters of health and nutrition. The sixth, the right to an education. Seventh, to choose their own partners and not be forced into marriage. Eight, to not be beaten or mistreated and for rape and attempted rape to be severely punished. Ninth, for women to hold positions of leadership. And tenth, for all the rights and obligations that would come forth in the, the laws that were yet to be passed to be applied to women as well. As you can imagine, after learning all this, I got excited again, right? So I saw this movement as a strong response to gender inequality and to the inequality created by government policies, especially neoliberalism. I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, this is it. This, I'm very excited about this. But of course, life is happening. I'm getting ready to graduate early. It's my last, my junior year was actually gonna be my last year because I had finished my courses early. Um, and a professor encouraged me to enroll in the honors program. And again, another one of those life-changing moments. At first, I didn't wanna do it. It seemed like a lot of extra work and an extra year, but I didn't, in fact, have a plan for what I was gonna do. So I enrolled in this program, and I decided what I wanted to do for my project was to learn more about the Zapatista movement. So here's kind of the very short version of what happens after they declare war on the Mexican government. The whole world was watching, that's where that motto comes from, because of their use of the internet and drawing so much attention to the state of Chiapas. Um, and this memo went out from Chase Manhattan Bank to the Mexican government. The government will need to eliminate the Zapatistas to demonstrate their effective control of the national territory and security policy. A lot of pressure from the transnational corporations, from the US government, from the Canadian government. Again, because of NAFTA and what they stood to lose if this was happening in this very important place in Mexico. The Mexican government set a fifth of its military to Chiapas. The Mexican government has a very large military. That's a substantial chunk of its military. And it resulted in 12 days of war, hundreds of deaths on both sides, and then ultimately there was a ceasefire. The Mexican government and the Zapatistas entered negotiations about land, culture, and indigenous rights. And after about two years, finally these peace accords were signed. After those peace accords were signed, unfortunately, the Mexican government consulted with the US government about what to do when you sign treaties with native peoples. What do y'all know about what the US government did in terms of treaties that were signed here with native people? Violated all of them, so some historians say over 500 treaties were signed and ex exactly zero of them were followed through with. So the Mexican government took a page out of that book, uh, altered the accords, and just didn't recognize the things that they had already agreed to in the first place. The Zapatistas decided to return to their own communities and comply with what they had agreed to, but on their own. They decided they were gonna work to meet their own demands for land, housing, food, health, education, independence, liberty, democracy, justice, and peace. And that was kind of where the story ended at my time in my journey as a college student. Um, so I told my advisor, I'm, I need to learn more about this. I'm really excited about this. I need to learn more. And he said, you should. He was a theorist, a he's a revolutionary theorist. He did a lot of theorizing, which means he spent a lot of time in the library. Um, he assumed I was gonna go spend a lot of time in the library. 
I decided I was going to just take myself to Chiapas. Unbeknownst to him, I scared him. I emailed him from Chiapas. I was like, hey, I'm doing that research we talked about. He's like, at the library? I'm like, no, I'm in San Cristobal. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was 21 years old. I was supposed to go with a global exchange uh, project. It got canceled at the last minute because I didn't have enough people. And I just decided, well, I'll just go anyway and figure it out. It can't be that hard. Um, I took a bus uh, to one of the Zapatista communities. I've, someone told me sort of how to get up there. And as I was on this combi, the woman sitting next to me was a Reuters reporter, um, a German Reuters reporter, who said, what are you doing? Where are you going? What are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just going to meet with the Zapatistas. She's like, do they know you're coming? I was like, uh, no. And she said, this is a whole process. You need to go back and get your passport. You need to write them a letter. You need to leave that letter with them. You need to formally request your intent to enter the community and tell them what you plan to do. And then you can come back in 48 hours and possibly have access to the community. Um, so I learned that these things in the, the communities move very, very slowly um, and on the Zapatista's terms, which is a really big lesson for me, especially coming from this culture of things happening quickly. And I came and went for about a year, uh, and then I ended up moving there after college and lived in Chiapas for a year. So I'm going to share with you what I learned from these communities. Um, they are now autonomous communities, and they basically started uh, by kicking all of the government officials and facilities out of their communities, government teachers, um, elected officials, whenever they could, the military. And they returned to indigenous ideas of collective representation and consensus-based decision-making. Um, there's a lot of complex indigenous ideology here I'd love to tell you more about, but I can just say now consensus-based decision-making means everyone in the room has to agree to be able to move on. Just look around you and imagine what it would take for all of us to agree on probably anything to be able to leave this room and move on with the next thing. So it's a very, very slow process. Um, no alcohol, no litter, no drugs, no migration. And again, this emphasis on largo plazo or long term, really thinking very, very far ahead and being willing to move very, very slowly. They return to an emphasis on cooperatives, um, using weaving, coffee, candles, and bread as things they could sell collectively, and collective animal care and child care and agriculture. And they started a training prog program and really kind of built up all the infrastructure for healthcare, education, and local governance, at least in the main community where I spent the most of my time. So I'm gonna focus on those three areas for this first half of the presentation before I tell you about what I saw in other places. Um, so they developed their own autonomous healthcare clinics, and these clinics have everything from OBGYN to dentists and pediatrics. That's the hospital in Oventique, the community where I spent the most of my time. Um, it looks really different now. They've even invested more in it, and it's substantially bigger. Um, they use both Western and traditional medicine, so that's a picture I took at the pharmacy. Um, so the pharmacy is actually divided in half, and one side is all uh, Western or pharmaceutical medicine that most of us are probably familiar with. And then the other half was all traditional medicine, so a lot of plants and traditional healing remedies um, as well. A lot of collaboration with Doctors Without Borders, um, which helped them train promotores de salud or um, like community health workers to do some of this health work in their communities, and donations from all over the world. The clinic is entirely free. They'll serve anyone. The German reporter went and had a tooth extracted while we were there because she had an infection, um, and it was entirely free to her. They serve thousands of people a month. They also developed an autonomous school system. Um, at the time, it included kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, they've recently added a high school, and there's discussion about adding a university in Olympique. Um, they partner very closely with an NGO out of uh, San Diego called Schools for Chiapas. And it's a revolutionary education model, to say the least. It's multilingual. Um, a lot of those children are speaking up to four languages, Spanish usually being the fourth. Um, they learn gender equality in first grade. One of the homework assignments I saw for first graders was to go home and observe what mom's responsibilities were, what dad's responsibilities were, sisters and brothers. What are the differences and are they as they should be in first grade? That was a, a thing they were learning. Um, they learned a lot of revolutionary history, indigenous history, critical thinking, and on that graph, or that poster, you can't see it there, the word neoliberalism. So as a community college professor now, I know most college students aren't even going to encounter that word until later in their college careers, and that's a word that these kids were learning in primary school. The third and kind of final important arm of what they were doing um, was restructuring government uh, their government in their communities. They kicked out all the elected government officials from the Mexican state and started something that they called Juntas del Buen Gobierno. And really this loosely translates to good government councils. 
Um, and these are their local governing bodies. It's based entirely on volunteers. The volunteers are paid in farm work and food while they participate. Um, they're elected and removed by consensus, and they're supposed to rotate. The idea is that an entire village is going to learn to govern because everyone's going to take turns. So just to call out some names of people I know in this row, uh, Deb, Maya, Blanca, and Jackie would serve on the junta for a month, and then their turns would be up, and it would be the four folks behind them, and then the four folks behind them, and then eventually everyone will have had a turn participating in these local governing bodies. They deal with a range of issues. Um, on one particular day, they were meeting with me. Uh, those guys were waiting to be handled. <laughs> they were sitting outside with me. They were in a kerfuffle over their chickens. Some chickens had gotten out. They didn't know whose were whose, and they couldn't sort it out. They were bringing all the chickens to the governing body to have them help decide whose chickens belonged to who. Those are not the real chickens. No chickens were harmed for this presentation. Um, and then Chilean doctors who were coming with a project for helping create a new surgery center at the hospital. So the range of things that these community members are going to have to deal with in any given meeting um, was remarkable. However, what I found out after going repeatedly to meet with the juntas was that an entire village was not really learning how to govern. In fact, it looked like probably half of the village was learning how to govern because the women were not rotating out. In fact, that woman was the same woman every time I went, and the men were changing. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that that was happening, but this was really kind of my first wake-up call to the, the gap between discourse or what is said and practice what is done. And it was a real wake-up moment for me to realize that the things that the movement said it was doing weren't necessarily happening, and some of the things that were happening weren't being talked about. There were some good things that were happening that the women pointed my attention to, and I want you to know. They were very proud that many women now had access to health care, that men were drinking less, um, and as a result, there was less violence and rape. They were proud of how much organization there was among women for some of the things we just talked about, child care, animal care, agricultural products, the workshops. Um, they were proud of girls' education in schools, and really pointed me to the fact that women were participating in the cooperatives, but not in the good government bodies. Um, and one woman shared with me, we don't blame the compañeros or the men. The damn system has to be blamed. Women without men cannot struggle, and men without women can't either. So again, good things are happening, but not all the good things are being discussed, nor are all the good things being discussed actually happening. So this is kind of the beginning of a transition for me away from Zapatismo because I realized it was a very unique story. Um, but the issues they were facing of poverty and gender inequality, unfortunately, are not unique at all, right? Those are issues that people are facing all over the world. So I decided it was time to look more broadly at international development um, and see how, they were how different kinds of projects were addressing poverty and gender inequality. And I wanted to see, again, what was the discourse, what were people saying versus what was happening. So this research is um, what I did for my undergraduate degree and then for my master's thesis, and then I'm going to present my dissertation research. So I'd like to just pause here. I don't know if this is totally unconventional, um, but I'd rather just pause here and just take questions about the Zapatista movement, especially since so many of you hadn't heard about it um, while it's fresh in all of our minds. And maybe I could even pass around a microphone. Maria will come around with a microphone. Um, and I'd be happy to, to try my best and answer any questions you might have about what I know about the movement or my time in Chiapas before I share the second half of my research. Any questions I could answer? I was just wondering about you. Did you go to, is, is it called Chiapas? Chiapas, yep. Chiapas, did you mm -hmm. go by yourself? I did, and I did not intend to. I intended to go with the Global Exchange, um, which is an, an, uh, an NGO that organizes some intercultural uh, exchange trips. They canceled the trip at the last minute, and I ended up going entirely by myself, yes. Oh, wow. And whenever, did you ever go to the hospital and have any treatment done that was the more natural and indigenous like medicines? I did not um, in the Zapatista communities, but I am familiar with uh, traditional medicine in Mexico more broadly. But no, I didn't have that opportunity while I was there in the Zapatista communities. Okay. Thank you for those questions, yeah. What else? Any other questions about Chiapas or the Zapatista movement or my experience doing research as an undergrad? I was just wondering what it looked like in the two days that you said that, um, like you couldn't go there yet because they like wouldn't allow you to go yeah. in, and like you had no idea. Like, what did those two days look like? Just more in depth. 
That's such a great question. I haven't thought about those two days in a long time. I know in retrospect uh, that I realized how naive I was. Um, and I was staying at a hostel in town. So this first community that I showed you, Oventhik, that's the hospital and that's the uh, school. It's pretty much mostly the town. There's the school, the hospital, and a couple other little buildings. Um, so I took a long, windy bus ride. I want to say it was about two hours in a little combi, which was that vehicle I showed you on the last side. Um, and so I just had to turn around and go back. And I went back to my hostel, and I, I think I really had to reckon with myself, what was I doing? Who did I think I was to just march down to this place and expect that they would be excited to see me? Um, and of course, write the letter explaining what I intended to do, make the copy of my passport. And in that letter, I did explain that my intention was to just interview Zapatista women. Um, and when I returned to the community and presented these documents to someone who was standing at the gate, they then passed my documents on to the Junta del Buen Gobierno, um, who reviewed my request and then met with me. So again, really things moving very slowly. So they told me, we're going to look at your request and then you can come back and we'll let you know whether or not you can do this research. I was like, great, I'll see you after lunch, right? Like very much on American time. And they were like, no, we'll see you in February. And I think that was in November or something. I was like, uh, I have to go back to California. And they were like, OK, and we'll see you then. So again, another lesson for me in that things were going to move slowly. I wasn't going to decide how things were going to happen. Um, and so I did make multiple trips based on sort of their response to my request to do this research. Does that answer that? Thank you for making me think about that. I, I hadn't thought about that in a while. Other questions? I saw, oh, yeah. Oh, are we on? OK. Did you ever? discover, understand why the women weren't rotating? Uh, yes. And do you want to share that now, or is this a reveal later? No, there's no reveal. I'm actually just <laughs> going to move away from this entirely. Okay. Um, so part of what was happening with the juntas is that uh, you did have to be elected um, and re removed by consensus. And the idea of even putting someone or nominating someone or someone nominating themselves, um, really that gender equality and empowerment work hadn't been done. Uh, yet. So to assume that a woman was going to nominate herself or nominate another woman when they're coming out of a very, very long um, experience of gender oppression without any of that gender equality yet, I, I think they kind of put the horse before the cart, if that makes sense. They, they hadn't done enough of the work around creating gender, and gender equality for women to want to participate in that way or for them to be recognized as participants. So the revolutionary law set out all these beautiful and lofty goals right about what they thought should be happening but also in reference to the fact that none of these things were happening which is part of why this document had to be drafted um, so for women to want to participate in the struggle or be seen as figures of authority um, or to have the right to an education all that work had to go in for them to even get to the point where they were going to nominate themselves or be elected to serve on the governing bodies the other thing that I think is an issue, one woman straight up told me it was a boys club. She said, this is the same thing as the old government. It's men acting in this very kind of macho way, overriding us. It's hard to get a, a word in edgewise, that sort of thing. Um, I was looking for the side with the image of them. Uh, so I think that was part of what was happening, was that it felt like a very, still like a very male model of government. And I think there's some interesting stuff there too. Maybe women had a different vision for what those governing bodies would have or could have looked like. And they were very insistent to point me towards, there's revolutionary government stuff happening. It's just not happening in these good government meetings. What's happening is at the cooperatives. It's happening in the way we're helping take care of each other's children. Um, it's happening in the way that we're getting empowered uh, to participate in some of those other activities. So I think that explains some of it. Yeah. Other questions about the Zapatista movement? How many people were a part of this? That's a good question. How many people identified with the Zapatista movement at the time and today? I actually don't have the numbers off my head, off the top of my head anymore. And it's one of those things that there's a lot of loose affiliation. So this main community that I was in has become something of a hub. Um, and there are, you know, villages all around that community of Oventik that identify as Zapatista, but there's also a community right next door that doesn't identify with the Zapatista movement. There are communities outside of Chiapas that identify as Zapatista, especially in southern Mexico. Um, 
there was a group that took Zapatismo to Los Angeles at one point um, and so were claiming to be Zapatistas living in an autonomous community in Los Angeles. And again, we just don't really know that much about kind of who fits and who, you know, in what way. There's no clear rules for what it takes to call yourself a Zapatista. Um, but I remember hearing kind of at the peak, one and a half million families were probably identifying as living in some sort of autonomous Zapatista zone. So I don't know what it looks like today. Things have changed um, a bit. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the best answer I can give you. Is it's, it's wide reaching in its ideology, but in terms of these communities, this really is the main, the main one, this community of Oventhik, and then the other villages are much smaller. All right, I'm gonna move on. And I'm gonna share with you what happened when I decided to ask this question about international development more broadly. Um, so I was motivated by what I saw in Chiapas, and for that PhD dissertation, I decided I wanted to ask what else is happening in the name of women and international development. So I started with popular development projects and wanted to see how they were affecting the lives of women. And then I wanted to look at some of the unintended consequences, both good and bad, of those projects. International development is a huge, broad topic, and I'd love to hear what some of you know um, or what your experiences have been around international development. A good starting place for those of us who haven't learned much about international development is these United Nations Millennium Development Goals. They were set in the year 2000. They were supposed to be met by 2015. Bad news, spoiler alert, we haven't met them. Um, and this is what they said. Eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, which means all children would be in school, at least for the primary years, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, kids dying before their fifth birthday, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and a global partnership for development, which who knows what that means? I don't, I don't know that anyone knows. So as you can see, only number three and five are explicitly about women, right? Yet what I will argue is that most international development work is actually targeting women. And there are some reasons for that. A good place to start would be a term called the feminization of poverty. We do know that at least 70% of the world's poor are women. So in some ways, women are most likely dealing with these issues. But I want to focus on the way they're being targeted by these programs. One thing is to say that women are facing poverty. Another thing is to put the responsibility of addressing some of these problems on women. So I'm gonna to present to you some of the popular development discourse and some of the popular development practices. Again, the discourse is what's being said and then the practice is what's actually happening or what's being done. I'm gonna introduce this to you through a quick clip of a documentary. It's about six minutes long um, and there are some references to violence against women and girls, some pretty explicit references, not images, but in the language. So if for any reason you decide that's not for you, this is a perfect time to take a bathroom break. Just don't drink the water out of the water fountain. Um, so this is the main message. It's about empowering girls and seeing women and girls as the solutions to some of those world problems that we just saw before. The kind of quintessential example of it for me is a book called Half the Sky. It was written by um, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu Dunn. And that's their basic argument. If we empower girls and women, they can be the solutions to most of the problems we saw in the previous screen. This book spurred college campus clubs, celebrity involvement, a campaign by Nike. Millions of dollars and millions of people got involved after the book came out. Um, and so I'm gonna show you this document, or the clip, the six minute trailer of the documentary, because it really kind of, for me, summarizes the popular discourse. It also puts some of the images in your head of the places I'm gonna go next, um, and some of the problems that women are facing. I'm gonna critique their approach to these problems, to putting the responsibility of solving the problems on women and girls, but I will definitely tell you these problems are real, um, and, I, and I saw them everywhere I went. So we're gonna watch this quick clip, I think, I don't have to exit out. How we treat women and girls is absolutely essential to who we are as a people. Issue of gender equality globally must be addressed if the problems that we share across the world are being solved. It's the way that we can bring greater peace and balance in this world. We're at the point of freedom. And that is two things. One is it's absolutely
they have to buy it. And you have to buy condoms as long as the victims are poor, rural, female, illiterate. They don't have a voice. Don't want to forget that. <laughs> to be physically present in a place is irreplaceable. Nicholas is right. You have to show up. I'm fine. <laughs> she is fine. Okay. This is like a war map, a strategic map. Where do we need someone to fight the enemy? She doesn't have a regular pulse. Disease, death. Celebrities can bring these issues into the limelight. That's just a no-brainer. That's your job, you know, to shine a little light on people that are actually doing the hard lifting. Mate, that's what I tell you. It's so. They're from a brothel? From a brothel. You can't come up with something more beautiful than a young, innocent girl. And to inflict that experience on that human being is unspeakably cruel. So she has been like 10, 12 black a day. If she don't want it, maybe it can I want to empower survivor to stand up and say no. If they want to say no. Is it three year old girl who has been raped and she's just come back for follow up? Yeah. We shouldn't allow the violence that has been inflicted on women to continue a muster because it can't stop and they need to be part of the solution. Stay safe, okay? Sometimes the problem feels so big that changing one life doesn't feel like enough. But it is. So every person, every corner of this world needs to raise a voice and say this has to stop. This is not rocket science. This is not a problem that is unsolvable, that we have to invent something new. It just takes political will. The rights we want, we want to choose our husband. We want to own the land. We want to go to school. We don't want to be cut anymore. We want also to make a decision. We want to participate in politics to be leaders. We want to be equal. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. If we are going to see real development in the world, then our best investment is with Okay. So returning to sort of what the main message is here, let's see if I can get this back um, into presentation mode. The main message here again is empowered girls and women as solutions. Um, and actually what they say is if you help a woman, she helps a village, she helps a community, she helps a country, and then saves the world. And my critique of that really is that that's a pretty hefty order for the world's most marginalized population, right? If we're already saying that poor women probably bear, carry a lot of the burden of the problems we mentioned before, to then say they also need to be the solution to that problem um, was concerning to me. So there's a lot of expectations of and pressure on women through these international development projects. And I wanted to know what some of the consequences were. So I'm going to walk you through my research for my dissertation. Um, it was called Women in Development, The Good, the Bad, and the Possible. And I did a multi-sided feminist ethnography um, in Mexico, India, and Ethiopia. And I looked at a range of projects, everything from small composting workshops in Guerrero, Mexico, to multi-million dollar USAID operations to transition women out of sex work in Ethiopia, um, and tribal women's weaving cooperatives in the, the Himalayas of India. So I did participant observation and interviews in organizations and communities in each of these places. And again, the kind of three trends, I, or the two trends I found was that there were good things that were happening and bad things that were happening that were unintended. That was not what the project set out to do, um, but it had this unintended consequence. So I want to start with the good. Um, and these are some unexpected ways that women were experiencing empowerment through some of these projects. 
Um, one I identified as more freedom to move. This is a quote from a woman who said, I was sad only in my house all day. Now when I am here seeing and doing different things, I feel happy. So the freedom to move just afforded by having to show up for these meetings or be a part of these different projects was something a lot of women identified as bringing a lot of joy to their life. Um, particularly in Ethiopia, uh, the support for rejecting harmful traditional practices um, is something that women found very empowering. These women said, we didn't used to talk about harmful traditional practices. Now we have promised we won't do those things to our daughters, um, particularly child marriage and female genital cutting. A lot of these projects to participate in them, the women have to agree those are things that they will not do to their daughters. Um, so some of these women identified that as being a very empowering opportunity to have conversations about and challenge some of those practices. Um, don't make me explain euvolectomy. I, I still don't entirely understand it. Hopefully someone else here does. It has to do with removing something that hangs in the back of your throat. We could talk about it after. Improved health. Um, women said that they had increased body mass index, decreased anemia, reductions in HIV, and just overall health improvements as a result of participating in these projects. Something as simple as the leader of the sewing group saying, maybe you're always getting a headache when we sew because your eyes are bad, and a woman going to get her eyes checked and then getting glasses, um, to obviously reductions in HIV and overall physical and mental health improvements that came from participating in some of these organizations. More decision-making power and improved gender relations in the home. Um, this was particularly true for women who are participating in income generating activities, like these women you see here who are in a pottery co collective. Um, they said their husbands were more likely to listen to their ideas as a result of participation in that project, and that, that my family cares more about my health now. They want me to be well so I can work. One of these women told me a story about her mother-in-law offering her a second bowl of soup, which had never happened to her in her life, and she was like, What's going on? Why? And she said, I want you to be able to go to the cooperative and make the pottery so we get more money. So they wanted to take better care of the women when they were participating in these projects. And the last and final um, important empowering experience that cannot be understated is something I called increased social solidarity. Um, I realize that top quote is very hard to see, but it says, these ladies gave my son his vision. Um, and that was a woman who was involved in a group in northern India, and her son had a vision impairment. Um, and she found out that there was a surgery that might restore his vision, but it was far away in the capital and it was going to be very expensive. And so the women in her group started saving behind her back for months and months and months to ultimately give her the money she needed to get on the train and go get that surgery for her son. So she always said her eyes belonged, or his eyes belonged to them, that his vision was thanks to them. The, the woman you see in the kind of center right of the picture, um, explained to me that most of her family members had died, but that these women in her saving circle would be the people who would bury her. And that brought her great comfort to know that, that even though she didn't have a lot of family members anymore, um, these women would be here for her even you know, in her passing. And then lastly, there was a story in India um, of a woman who was in an abusive uh, marriage. Her husband was violent towards her, and she hadn't showed up for the group meeting, but she was always very punctual, and her group members knew that something must not be right. And they went and they asked the husband, and he wouldn't say where she was, and they got suspicious. Um, and they demanded that he lead her, them lead the women to her, and she was actually locked in a cow shed. She had been severely beaten and uh, denied of food and water for a period of time and was probably about to die. The women removed her from that cow shed. They actually confronted the husband, and they brought him to justice before the tribal elders. Um, so again, the, the fact that the, that woman would say, these women saved my life, that cannot be understated. The experience of coming together and feeling like there are other people around you who care about your life and your well-being. Some of the unexpected disempowering consequences, um, this is the bad. If I've looked at the good, the bad, and the possible, these are the things that I don't think are going well. The first I'm calling the creation of a development elite class. And basically what I saw here was that um, there were women, usually better educated, usually from the urban areas and a bit more wealthy, who often become the NGO practitioners or the people who are going to carry out these projects. Um, and they go off into the rural areas, and uh, they are the ones who are being paid to learn about participants' life, yet participants are not encouraged to learn about them. Um, they're supposed to be kind of an example of empowered women, but there's this real disconnect. They really don't know each other. They don't know much about the, the empowered women from the city, about their lives. 
And many of the women in the projects I worked with were eager to ask me about my life, about gender equality in my home and in my country. And they had a lot of questions about the women who were coming to do these projects with them. One statement here, we think her life is very different from ours. She's educated. She lives somewhere in the city. She comes here in a taxi. We think she gets paid a lot. But again, they didn't know, and there was this disconnect in communication. This other issue I saw was something I called divide and conquer. And this, to me, was the straining of relations between community members because of the way these projects are often carried out. So for instance, all of the women in a group might submit individual applications for, let's say, like a pig raising project is very popular in Mexico. Um, the NGO is going to rifle through the applications. Turns out they can only let five women instead of all 15 have access to this pig raising project. And the women don't know why. And then they get back the results, and they find out they were denied, and their next door neighbor wasn't. Um, and that creates a lot of division and tension, especially, again, because they don't know why some women are getting something and another isn't. I watched as a group that was in charge of water filter distribu distribution look at a map and just arbitrarily kind of draw a line throughout the, through the community and say, like, the line's got to be drawn somewhere. Not everyone's going to get a filter. So that means next door neighbors, people who have been living next to each other, sometimes for generations, um, are going to have this new thing that's dividing them. Again, maybe access to a good or a service that previously didn't exist before. There's a lot of backlash, unfortunately, for women who participate in these projects. Um, there's a lot of violence against women who are participating, and then as a result, increased restriction of their movement. So one of the husbands that I talked with said, when your women is with these activities, the people, they don't understand where she's going. They'll say things like she's being a slut, a gossip, making trouble. Um, and there aren't really very many protections for women who are being asked to show up and participate in some of these projects. Again, going back to this relationship with the elites coming in to kind of observe what's happening, another thing that concerned me was the amount of control and governing and surveilling. Um, sometimes it's by other women in the group. Sometimes it's by the leaders who are coming in from the urban areas. But in regard to the harmful traditional practices, someone told me, we check to see if the women in our savings group are doing harmful traditional practices, like female genital cutting. We look hard. And to me, that sounded very invasive. It sounded like maybe they were even inspecting each other's daughter's bodies to understand who was doing what. Um, so again, a lot of controlling, governing, and surveilling that really can create a lot of um, suspicion and secrecy and mistrust even among community members. This is something that was happening in India. Um, around the microcredit uh, phenomenon. How many of you are familiar with microcredit or microlending? A couple people. Um, so I was really concerned to hear a woman share this story with me. We know three women from our village who have poisoned themselves just last year. It was because of their loans. Many debtors, so many debtors were coming from them. Oh no, it was four women, four women dead. So basically what happens with microcredit is a lot of the time it's contingent on gender. You have to be a woman to get that loan. Um, so a lot of women that I met with were actually taking out loans for their husbands, for their brother, for their sons, for men in their community, and they were in over their head, totally overwhelmed by having six, 10, 15 loans. There's no check, check and balance system. No one says you can only take out so many loans like the US government does around student loans, or at least there's some limitations on how much you can have. Um, it was an infinite amount of debt. And these are communities uh, where there's really deep ideas around responsibility and honor. And it really kind of violated some of those cultural values without, again, providing any protections for women who are in that situation. The last and kind of most important thing that I was worried about is something I called the fourth shift. And we're just going to walk you real quick through some sociological theory here. Um, this is based on Arlie Hochschild's notion of the second shift. She's a sociologist at UC Berkeley. And what she said basically was this. If a woman's first shift is her paid job outside of the home, the second shift is all of the unpaid labor she does inside of the home, child care, domestic tasks, all the things that keep a family economy running. Some activists, especially in the US, have talked about a third shift being community responsibilities. Maybe you go to PTA meetings, the civic engagement, voting, things like that. I saw that most of the women in the places in the world I went to were doing all of those first third shifts, and then this fourth shift that was development work, showing up for these meetings and projects. So here's what some of those women shared with me. For the time and hard work it will take us to grow three or four organic squashes, I would rather work at a real paying job. That's a common project. Um, people want to start a small organic garden. They're very time intensive. Some women were asked to show up for five hours a week to work at this organic garden. And that woman was quite, quite right to say she might only be taking home three or four organic squashes for that five hours of work a week. 
Another woman shared, I have to walk here after I've gathered wood and water and made the meal and washed the clothes and cared for the animals. I'm so tired. So just thinking about her day and those demands on her time and her body, her headspace. Um, and then another woman just told me, I don't even have the time. Sometimes these meetings and workshops last two hours. There aren't even two hours in my day that I can be showing up to participate. So she's probably sacrificing something else. The possible. This is where I'm going to close. Um, what I think is that if we let community members come up with their own definitions, especially around gender empowerment, what we would have most often would be projects that would involve men. Both men and women have told me that everywhere I went. Um, that was a picture from actually a really fun project we did on the coast in Mexico um, where we involved men. And we did this really interesting activity that has uh, stuck with me, where we had men and women map out um, women, what they think me the men are doing in the course of a day, women, what they think men are doing in the course of the day, and then we matched them up. If you've never done that in some category of inequality in your life, go home and do it. It's mind-blowing. It's a very, very fascinating activity. Um, so it was funny, but also really enlightening, and men were really eager to participate, and women were really eager to have them participating. So I think that's a great place for possible, um, you know, for things to change in terms of development projects. I also think in terms of academic research, scholarship, it would be important to take from the feminist tradition the idea of being self-reflexive, so thinking about our own selves in the role of research, how it matters who I was when I went to these places to do that research. Um, and that development practices should allow for new forms of participatory action research, which basically just means let community members dictate what is, ha what is gonna happen in their communities, have their voices drive the projects, and that would likely lead to more collaboration among the members and the practitioners. And then lastly, I wanna close by asking what would development projects look like if responsibilities and rewards were shared more equally among the members? And what do you all think is possible? So thank you for your time. I'll end there so that we can hopefully have a conversation about this topic. Um, and I'll take questions. Thank you. So any questions are fair game. Hopefully you all have some. I tried to end early hoping we would have a good discussion. So what do you all think? What are some things you would want to know more about or just talk about together? I guess I have a question. Yeah. Um, in in the community college that we're at right uh -huh. now, is there something that you would suggest or encourage us to do to um, kind of bring this inequality in where we at right now? Um, sort of things that we can do to help. Things that we could do here at ACC to address global inequality. Oh my goodness. How much time do we have? <laughs> How many of you want to sign up? Well, I think that's such a great question to think of ways that we as here in the ACC community can address some of these issues of global inequality. I also would just backtrack to say part of my experience with this was that as a young person who learned a little bit about inequality in the US and in my own childhood and in my own experience, um, for some reason I was really excited by imagining this being something that happened somewhere else. And I'm just kind of like thinking off the cuff here. I wish I knew that this wasn't being videoed so I could kind of walk through that thought with you. But really, um, I kind of had to go out to come back in, if that makes sense to any of you. So I went to all these kind of places that were very exotic and different for me um, to eventually very kind of slowly come to terms with all of the issues that we have here at home. And that's a process I'm still in. I still feel kind of new to that. Um, it feels much harder to me to grapple with the issues in my own community than it does to imagine getting on a plane to India and showing up kind of excited and naive about what's happening there. Um, so I think you're asking a really important question also about why sometimes do are we more interested in what's happening somewhere else instead of here. There's a, a great amount of global inequality in Austin, right? Um, so I'm not in a good position as an academic uh, to reflect on those issues, but as a professor here at ACC, it's something I do really care deeply about. And so if there are students who are thinking about global issues and there's a way to address some of these questions together, I would encourage you to approach a faculty member like me um, to maybe do a research project uh, or to start some sort of a student organization or to connect with an organization that already exists here in Austin um, because, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to think about in terms of here in our own community. So I would, I would love to have that conversation with people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you.
Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I have talked with a friend before about um, like gender roles and the ideas of how a woman should act and how a man should act in other countries across mm -hmm. the world. And they said that they thought that possibly um, because it's such a different culture um, in the way that in the way of religion and in the way of how the countries govern mm -hmm. that maybe this is what these women know and this is what these women want and this is all that they want they don't mm -hmm. believe in the um, the roles of women like in America and I don't really agree with that but I was just curious did you ever find that like in your travels or what yeah. do you think about that? I totally understand what you're trying to ask, and thank you so much for that question. It's important and also, of course, huge. So my kind of short version um, of a response to that would be that cultural relativism is important. It's important to not go to another place and take our own ideas of the way we've experienced culture and society and impose them on other people. It's important to actually let those cultural standards and practices be relative to that culture. It takes a lot of learning about another culture to know what would be relative to that culture. Um, but it's also important, I think, for a lot of the women I talked with to feel like they can reflect on and question and really kind of observe cultural practices around gender and then make their own decisions. So those apathesis are really clear about that, for instance. So um, a lot of the traditional practices around child marriage, um, even alcohol being used in religious ceremonies, those were things that they had really kind of long um, and heated conversations about to be able to decide which of these practices do we want to keep as they are, which do we want to modify, and which do we want to abandon altogether. Um, and that really requires people being empowered to have a voice and to be able to think those thoughts together. Um, and as it turns out, some of those practices might be embraced. Uh, and that's something we would have to accept if that practice is different than what, what we would you know, expect for those uh, people. But yeah, I do think that's part of what these women are asking for, the ability to even question some of the things that have been traditional practices, and then you know, change them or reject them if they feel it's no longer appropriate. So yeah, that's a, that is a really great question. What else are y'all thinking about global inequality and women and NGOs, Zapatistas, doing research? Have any of you in here done any research yet? Not yet. Are you excited to do some? Do you want to go sleep in the library like the slide I showed you? You're all going to get on the plane and go somewhere exciting. <laughs> I encourage you, if you have the opportunity in any of your classes or projects, to get out there and kind of see what's happening in the world. Uh, I was surprised how much I could do, even just as a community college student. So if you have something that's interesting to you, it, it's not as hard as you think to get out there and go do some observation. Ariana, I have a yeah. question. Yes, please. I'm um, interested in what you learned about uh, women's participation in local governance and yeah. decision making, yeah. and whether or not there was increased participation in these areas where development projects were taking place. Right. And how that fed into the success or failure of these development projects yeah. and in the improvement of women's lives. Again, a really great question. And I think my, what I, what I think is actually the most important, again, to what I said to Jackie, is that if gender equality is on the table already, the oppor those opportunities are going to be, the women are going to take advantage of them if the, that work is already sort of in place. But to just come in and, let's say, put a mandate that says, which has happened in southern India and Kerala that has a very high participation of women in government, or Rwanda, which has one of the highest participations of women in government uh, in the world, to come in and mandate that a certain amount of women have to fill those seats um, often results in kind of empty participation, much like the microfinance crisis. So a woman might be in that seat, she might be elected to that office, but again, because there hasn't really been a lot of change in terms of gender inequality in the community, sometimes she's there pushing all of her husband's ideas um, or doing what her father is telling her to do. And so again, I really think it's important to first you know, have that discussion and have that movement around gender equality in the community and then that representation in politics because especially in those two places I just mentioned, we know that's part of what's happening as women are kind of being forced to participate um, and not actually able to even bring sometimes their own issues or ideas to the table. 
Women who are being empowered through these projects are more likely to feel comfortable sharing their voices, and that's something I learned. Even just the first woman I met with in the Zapatista community, I thought she had really bad asthma, because every time we met, she was very short of breath, um, and she ended up actually telling me, I am just so nervous talking to you. I don't talk very often, and all of us know me doing a presentation, like shortness of breath is a sign of, of anxiety. Um, women were not used to talking to anyone other than their children in some of those communities, and those of you who talk to kids, you know that's a whole different kind of conversation, right? So to be able to be engaging with other adults as your peers and even just feeling like you have that communication tool um, was something that a lot of these women don't have. So to sit in a group with women where you're sewing together all day and you're conversing and then you talk eventually to the group leader and then there's definitely a path there around empowerment that I think would ultimately lead to feeling like you're able to participate in something like a local government body. So I definitely see a lot of these skills as leading closer towards um, but again I'm concerned about the demands especially on on women's time there's just so many hours in the day uh, to participate in some of these things so I think we can't say women aren't participating in local government because they don't want to or they're not empowered or I think we have to look at the structural the way it's set up right we have to look at kind of the systemic issues of what are we expecting of someone who's going to sit on city council or participate in government in some of those ways so kind of the division of labor men would come over and do more of the work that women are doing and then and then mentoring women to do more of the work of governance. Uh, that's a long road process that is going to take a long time to Sure. Get or if so much of that work didn't exist in the first place. If maybe the state was providing some of those services that historically has been a state's responsibility to provide, um, women would have time to not be going to gather water. I'm thinking about that this morning in Austin. It's my first time boiling water since I lived in India, um, and it's a very time-consuming process. Imagine going to get that water. Where, do any of you even know where you would go in Austin to get the 120 million gallons of water we're all using every day? and carry it back somehow on your body if you don't have transportation, and then find the wood to boil it, to purify it, to be able to even make your meal with it. I mean, we're just seeing a sliver of how time consuming that process is, right? So I think, again, time is a big issue there, and I, I'm, I don't think all the responsibility is on men. I think there's, there's a missing player here that for me is the state. Some people think it's the private sector. They might be better suited to come in and meet some of these needs, and that's very much what's happening. So I use this motto in my classes. I don't have any of my students here because they all have learned all this already. They were like, why are we going to come here? You talk about it again. But we use a motto called step up, step back in my classroom. And the idea is that if you usually step up, I have you step back a bit so someone new can step up. And I like to kind of use that as the short and dirty explanation for neoliberalism, which is kind of this moment that we're in. The state is stepping back and the private sector is stepping up. So a lot of the things that the state used to provide, the private sector is now providing. And in these examples, that's usually some kind of an NGO. And as the NGO steps up to provide those resources, a lot of things happen along the way. That multi-million dollar USAID grant I was looking at, it's hard to follow the money and see where all those millions and millions and millions go when the women I was talking with are receiving a $9 sewing machine with no sewing supplies and are told, stop being a prostitute, stop being involved in, in sex work, and here's a sewing machine, go ahead and get started. This is a multi-million dollar grant, where does all that money go? So it's a very kind of complicated response to some of these crises, is having these NGOs step in and do that work. And it's very piecemeal, right? We have very small organizations addressing some of these issues, or big, large organizations like Save the Children are using multi-billion dollar budgets. There's just so much happening that it's hard to, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to trace all of the different solutions, it's just things that I think the state should probably be dealing with, my personal opinion. How many of, sorry, how many of the NGOs are looking at those infrastructural issues that the state should have done? Like, so the state stepped back, the infrastructure, water, transportation, all those things. Well, I would say going back to those millennial development goals, um, in, those are, the, those are the major goals that people are organizing around, also because that means there's money for them, right? So these are the things we kind of agreed internationally to care about. Um, so if you want to write a grant to get some funding, those would be some good places to go, or better yet, some good buzzwords to use in your grant, right? So those are the things you're supposed to be addressing. Um, 
I don't know how many of those you would consider infrastructural. No one's saying, give me billions of dollars to create a universal primary education system. But people are saying, we would like a couple hundred thousand dollars to get uniforms to kids in this one particular village. So again, very piecemeal, smaller solutions to problems that are, as you're pointing to, probably much larger infrastructure issues, right? Other questions? Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. And uh, the question I have is about the sample sol selection process. I'm sorry, will you repeat the that? The sample selection, selection process. Yeah. And these three countries like Mexico, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and then India are very large countries, yep. very diverse in terms of economy, in terms of the culture, the ethnic background, the political yeah. Uh, environment are very complex and the sites which you select may not represent Absolutely. what is yeah. happening at a national level. Yeah. So when you are delivering this information for someone who hasn't been to those countries, sure. may have the understanding that this thing is happening uniformly oh, across yeah. the nation. So did you try to find sites which is very much common in those countries? Yeah. Or were you just simply going to a site where you have that kind of project going on? Right. So it might not necessarily reflect what yeah. is happening on the other part of the country. Excellent question, and this is in no way reflective of what, of what is happening from village to village, let alone at the national level, let alone internationally. Absolutely not. What I did do was I set out to go to some places I wanted to go to, and it turned out um, there are so many logistical things that are going to come up along the way as you try and do research that only so much was even possible in the first place. For instance, I spent a month in Egypt and realized I, I have no idea what's going on here. There's no way I can even write about this place, and I instead just observed and didn't include it. Um, there were places that I went to that I thought things were going to happen that didn't happen. Um, so no, in no way is this sample actually representative of what's happening. It's representative of where I was able to go, and that depended on the fact that I didn't get any grant money. I put this on a credit card. Um, I relied on the kindness of people to help me figure out lodging, and in some places I did not feel safe. Um, I, there were a lot of factors that contributed to where I was going to be and not be. Um, so you're right. This is not a representative sample. What I was looking at is projects that tend to say they're empowering women somehow. In what ways are those women experiencing empowerment? In what ways are they not? And there was a very diverse um, amount of, a very diverse range of things that projects were intending to do. I just kind of presented today the consequences that were not intended of those projects. So if the project set out to, let's say, generate income for a woman, we already know that's hopefully going to be one of the outcomes. What were the unintended outcomes of that project? And that's where those findings were summarized from. So the findings that I was sharing that were the summary were things I did see in all of these very different places. But you're right to say that the, the diversity of what's happening within each of those countries is, um, yeah, it, it's a lot. And I, I couldn't entirely take that on by any means. Yeah, it was, it was hard to get to some of these places. And so that really ended up dictating where I was able to go and what I was able to see. Any other questions? Are there any, I guess, actual classes and courses at ACC about women's development and women's equality? Or does anyone know that? I'm so new here that I'm going to have to defer to someone who knows their courses a bit better. Does anyone know if we have courses specifically around gender or women's experiences? Yeah. Gender courses. William, do you know? <laughs> what can be taught, it limits faculty from uh, developing courses that would address specific topics like gender inequality in an international setting or uh, 
choosing you know, some countries or group of countries to examine this particular problem. Mm -hmm. So I think faculty have to be innovative in how they bring that into their curriculum in the classroom. Yeah, definitely. I guess that's why stuff like this is so important. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you had this. Thank you. This I'm so glad you were here. And I think Deb might have a point to the courses we Does offer. That work? Yeah, the, we do in sociology have an American minorities class that, as William was saying, we're kind of limited. We can't teach, for example, a gender class. But we do, American minorities is sort of not just looking at gender, race, sexuality, class, all these issues. One of the things, kind of picking up on your point of talk to your professors about projects you're interested in, that would be a, you know, if you really want as students for us to teach a class like gender development, uh, push, your push your teachers to do that because we can offer, for example, an intro to sociology or an intro to philosophy or an intro to government that has a focus on uh, gender and development. So uh, that would be an option as ways for you, for you as students to empower yourself to kind of take charge of your college here to, to, to get some of those courses you want right. because we are kind of limited in what we can do. Thank you, Doug. We also have in the International Programs Office study abroad programs. So that's an opportunity where you can um, go and experience what life is like in another country. Um, they happen during the summer and they're geared towards ACC students. So that's something else that you can all explore to get to visit other countries. And I have a date with William to talk about possibly leading one of those courses. So if this looks like a match of interest, maybe we could even structure one around gender and development somewhere else. So reach out to me. I actually, maybe I could share my email. Uh, I don't see a board. I'm so used to writing on a board. I'm like, where am I going to type that? Maybe I'll just stay after. And if anyone's interested in being in touch with me further about any of these topics, I'll give you my email address and we can communicate that way. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.